doing well. Um, I hope you're all doing everything you can to stay safe and sane out there. Um, apparently, we have a really serious situation going on at the Capitol. Once again, um, it's if it's not one thing, it's another, and it's every week um, at this point. So do everything you can to stay safe and stay sane out there. It's uh, it's not easy. Uh, and, um, you know, for what it's worth, that's what I'm doing over here. And um, it seems that, uh, you know, people do get a lot of um, a lot of information out of this. So I do appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, I am so happy to be here with you. Uh, and um, as I said, like I've, I've started this pretty much a year ago, a little over a year ago now, um, because of the pandemic. And um, I started George's Space Chat because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, I will continue to do this for as long as I can and for as long as I have uh, something to say and hopefully an audience. <laughs> but <laughs> either way, um, I, as I said, I hope you're all, you know, staying safe, staying sane. Uh, and I hope you all get uh, a lot of good information out of these videos, out of the follow-up videos. I highly recommend, once again, checking out um, the topics on uh, George's Space Chat. Uh, I try to organize all of the videos and sort of catalog all of them in the topics, uh, meaning that the live videos are together with the follow-up videos that they accompany. So, um, or the other way around, the follow-up videos are together with the live videos that they accompany. Um, so sort of to, to give like a, a really nice, uh, you know, all around view of certain subjects, of certain topics, players, music, um, preparation, techniques, concepts, whatever. Um, check that out. It's, it, I find it helpful to have um, several perspectives on on a particular topic and um, out of all of these perspectives I can sort of pick and choose or or you know perhaps put together a picture for myself that um, again inspires me motivates me does all the things that um, hopefully these videos do uh, I see I have a bunch of people already out there let me just say hello to a couple of you um, what's going on Carlos Mania I see you um, Tony Ventura, what's going on? Darcel Andrews, good to see you. Rafaelo Pareas, uh, forgive me if I if I bungle some last names. Uh, I'm trying my best. <laughs> uh, what's going on? Uh, Vincent Sansoni, good to see you. Um, yeah, everyone who's out there, send me hello. Uh, give me a like, send me a, a comment. It's always easier to know who you're talking to and um, if there is anyone out there to talk to. Um, as as every week, uh, let me do a little bit of housekeeping first, um, and that is what's going on, Paul Nowinski. <laughs> you hooked up your calendar. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> I'm very happy for you. <laughs> so see, you didn't you didn't miss the today's video. <laughs> Glad to have you here. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> anyway, a um, little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you want to get in touch with me for for lessons or um, for remote con uh, for for recording, uh, please email me at george at georgefarmer.com. I can do uh, recordings of uh, electric basses, fretless, fretted, five string, four string, six string, and I can also do recordings of upright bass, arco, pizzicato. You name it, um, I got it here. I can even do, um, I can even do synth bass. Actually, uh, I'm set up for that now. So um, yeah, George at georgefarmer.com is the best way to get in touch with me. Also for lessons, I teach electric bass, I teach upright bass, um, I do teach beginner ukulele and beginner guitar. So um, acoustic guitar, I should say. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in, in taking any lessons with me, um, give me a shout out, george at georgefarmer.com. My rates are very reasonable. What's going on, Marco Panacea? Good to see you, my friend. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, if you want to contribute to the cause, to putting these videos together, to putting 
um, content up on George's base chat. I put my uh, Venmo and PayPal information into the description of this video. Um, any and all contributions, uh, donations are more than welcome. And for those who have already contributed, uh, once again, my deepest and heartfelt thank you to you. Um, you gra I'm, I'm, I, I cannot really express how uh, how grateful I am for your contributions. It's it means a lot to me. Bobby Brandon, what's going on? Hope all is well with you. All right. Um, that's a little bit of housekeeping. What that is concerned, uh, maybe a quick. Uh, uh, a quick summary of what's about to happen in in april um, obviously we're doing a live video today we're doing one next week with the great clint de gannon who himself is a drummer here in new york city uh, and then there are two weeks where i have to take off um, but then on um, april 30th i'm gonna have i'm gonna have a great guest um, and it's going to be jonathan Marin, um, the bass player again from new york city uh, I highly recommend checking out all of the videos. Clint DeGannon has a lot to say and has has a very, very unique um, vantage point, really, point of view, because I don't know a drummer, I don't know that many drummers who have played with Anthony Jackson, with Will Lee, with um, Gordon Edwards, uh, and with a slew of other high-end, high-caliber uh, musicians. So, And he himself is a high-end, high-caliber musician. Um, Every time I play with him, I learn something. Every time I speak with him, I learn something. And it's just a great hang uh, on top of everything else. So come check us out next week, um, April 9th. And then um, April 30th, um, the great Jonathan Maron joins me here on, on George's Space Chat. And um, I haven't quite figured out what to talk to him about because I've been a fan of his playing for a very, very long time. Um, but... One thing I can uh, sort of hint at uh, what I am thinking about talking with him about is taking uh, sort of taking classic recordings and analyzing them, distilling them down and taking that sound that you hear and making it your own and how that shows up in his playing, how that shows up, how that can show up in your playing. Um, I find that very often people do talk about, musicians talk about certain albums, but uh, it doesn't get really any more in depth um, about, okay, well, what do I do with the information, right? What do I do with um, life, uh, Aretha Franklin life at, at, at the Fillmore East, uh, Fillmore West? Um, you know, what do I do with um, uh, songs in the key of life? Like, what is the information that, that I can get from there? And perhaps this uh, this video that I'm about to do with uh, Jonathan Marin can perhaps spark some some interest or or motivate uh, or give you some give you the, the audience out there <laughs> some ideas of what to do with these live video uh, live um, with these classic um, influential recordings, right? Because at this point, you know, we have a lot of music to listen to. It's, um, needless to say, and and this kind of segues really well into today's video. Um, there's a lot of music out there. That's that's just that's just our life now in 2021, right? It's it, we don't have the record stores anymore. We don't have, or well, we have very few of them, right? Um, we don't necessarily have uh, record companies sort of funneling artists and and therefore you know being gatekeepers, the good and the you know good aspects of that and the bad aspects of that. Um, but now we as the consumers of music have this worldwide um, catalog of music for us to listen to. So it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be really interesting. Marco Panisia lets me know that I should talk to Werdin, uh, to Jonathan about Werdin's, Werdin White's influence on him. Yes, we will definitely do that. Um, I just saw Zane Mark, what's going on my friend? I hope all is well with you, I hope you're doing well. Um, and so all this to say that um, there's a lot of music out there and that kind of brings me to today's uh, guest, today's subject um, of this live video and that is, the subject is the wonderful world of Fima Ephron. 
Uh, for those who don't know, Fima Efron is a bass player here in New York City who uh, I first uh, met uh, via his recording with a band called Screaming Headless Torsos. And um, I'm glad you're well, St. Mark. Um, I see you. And uh, needless to say, uh, I've been a big fan of, of Fima's for, for some time now. Um, and uh, I've gotten to know him and um, we hung out a bunch of times. I believe that, and we're going to get into that in the, in the interview um, in just a little while. <coughs> Excuse me. But I believe he subbed for me at, at least two shows, if not more. Um, and uh, I've listened to him in live settings uh, for the last 15 years something like that um probably more um in a variety of settings large stages small stages um doesn't really matter i thoroughly enjoy uh everything that he puts out um i i am a fan of femus there's, there's just no two ways about that uh and um i hear all these influences that sort of make up a new york sound and perhaps a, a more contemporary new york sound aside from uh the heyday of the studio era meaning 70s going into 80s probably 60s 70s going into 80s <laughs> um so fema for me is is has always been um uh, a great example of of um, taking all these influences and making something new out of them right uh and uh, definitely just pushing the envelope pushing the envelope of what is considered to be one style or one genre of music um, because all of these labels by the end of the day don't necessarily mean that much it's do you like it or do you not like it uh, and um, does it mean something does it speak to you does it not speak to you those are kind of the questions that perhaps the consumer of music is asking themselves but um, again like FEMA has been this this example for me to uh, push the envelope and and um, you know try stuff and and see where it goes and the other thing that we will get into in just a second is also that our two paths have been wildly different um, not only are we different generations but the way he came to music and the way I came to music are night and day needless to say so without any further ado let me get FEMA on I see that he's waiting in the that he is in the waiting room um, and he is FEMA. All right. Let's see if this works. <laughs> What's going on, FEMA? Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. That's great, man. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to George's Bass Chat. Cool. Thank you. Man, I'm so glad to have you here. This is great. This is fantastic. How's everything going? It's cool, man. You know, just surviving this uh, pandemic yeah. one day at a time. Yeah, 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 yeah. No doubt, no doubt. Listen, just so you know, we are live on Facebook, so we have like a bunch of people already uh, watching us, and they're all super excited to see you. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, without any further ado, I just gave the audience a little bit of, of our background together. I think we met, I remember where we met, but I don't quite remember the year. I remember it was um, 251 West 30th Street, the, the, the musicians building where ultrasound was and where all the rehearsal places was and um and i'm in this i'm in the elevator and um waiting to go upstairs and the door opens and i'm on the first floor the door opens and uh this dude comes in and i take a closer look at him and say are you fema efron <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we met <laughs> i mean i didn't know you you know you certainly didn't know me um but i had read about you in bass player magazine um all those years ago and that, that was um probably um probably somehow had something to do with screaming headless torsos right so um give me give me a little bit of your background uh because i also hinted at the audience that the way how you came to music and the way how I came to music are like night and day, they're completely different. So why don't you take it away and 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 tell the audience um, how you how did you come to music? Okay, well, um, 
I got my first bass when I was 13. And uh, my dad and my mom bought it for my, my 13th birthday. It was a, a, a Fender Coronado, like a semi-hollow right. kind of thing, which was pretty cool. Um, right. And my dad was involved in music, but he was, he was like, he wasn't really a trained musician. So he kind of like, I was, I was sort of as a, as a young kid in New York, he had a loft mm -hmm. and he used to have all these avant-garde jazz musicians who'd come over and they would do these sort of like, you know, drug fueled, like epic jam sessions that went for like, you know, hours, you know, <laughs> the, 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 into the night. Yeah. You know, and, and so that was sort of like my first exposure to, you know, music as a young kid. I mean, I, I, I of course, listened to the Beatles and, you know, right. Otis Redding and Sam and Dave. And, you know, I was exposed to a lot of cool music, Sly Stone, right. um, Hendrix. And um, so it, at, at 13, I got my first bass and, you know, I started just I didn't really have any formal education on it, but I kind of would teach myself how to play like little tunes. I would make up songs. Right. Just like, I don't even, I wish I had a recording of them because I, don't, I have no idea what they would have sounded like now. Mm, mm. Well, that's, that's, that's the big, that's the big thing. Like that's the, you know, that's kind of what I was hinting at in, in our approach or our, uh, introduction to music because my in my introduction to music was predominantly through schools and yours absolutely not well actually i mean i what happened was i you know in my sort of uh youthful arrogance i was like yeah man i'm you know i'm, I'm bad i'm a bad cat you know i can play <laughs> at 13 years old you know <laughs> So, nice. <laughs> so I, I auditioned for music and art high school. Right. And the fun, I always tell the story because it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's sort of indicative of how, you know, how, it, I don't know what the word would be, like, uh, just not really arrogance, but just confident, you right. know, that I was and how, so when I auditioned for music and art, I, I literally, did not know the names of my strings. I didn't know E, A, D, G. Wow. I, I never learned it, you know, right. but I could play. Right. And and uh, I guess, you know, the people that, that uh, you know, did the audition, they they recognized something in me and they accepted me in the school, you know. Right, right, right. Which was kind of a miracle because there were people that auditioned for that school that had a really strong musical background you know right. at a young age and they didn't get in right so i was really lucky to, to for that to happen and then um that was kind of where my formal education started right right school. right so that was that was high school right um yeah. now did that somehow carry over into a college situation or anything like that yeah i went to queen's college and, and then I transferred to NYU and then I dropped out. And then I actually went back and completed my degree in like like five or six years ago. And I mm. went to purchase mm. just, just because I had a I had like a year of credits to finish. Right. And uh, the, the, the head of the department there, Todd Coleman, kind of made it easy for me to go back and, and complete it. Right. And it was a fun experience, actually. I, I, I've. I learned some stuff, you know. That, mm, uh, check that out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it's it's so deep because I remember us having our conversations about that, where you know I said like, um, yeah, I said this, I never learned music by myself. Like I always had a teacher, and and be it piano, you know, when I was six years old, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you you were like, well, I was at these sessions in lofts <laughs> and, and just played all the time and just made stuff up you know yeah. and, and 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 i thought like that that in and of itself is is fascinating right because right there you have a completely different um approach you have a completely different uh, you know in so to speak right um you know there is like this complete reliance on 
on on your ears in your case mm -hmm. right and there's a complete reliance on understanding what's written in front of me like you know on a piece of on a piece of paper on music right in my mm -hmm. case and this could not be more more different right you, the whole uh, approach towards rhythm you know how to how to see rhythm or how to hear rhythm how to feel it and all of that is night and day if you are jamming on a regular basis then you know if you read it on a piece of music in front of you on a regular basis so that's that's kind of where i was was getting with that um i'm glad to hear that that you still went to school that's awesome <laughs> yeah i didn't I mean, know. You know it's funny like I think that I think one of the lessons that I learned, like the uh, realizations that I had from my that early period of my, you know, exposure to music mm. and being in those environments where it was like, um, you know, not structured in any kind of way. I, I really I remember having this thought about how music was energy, mm. and it was like, you know different levels of energy there was like you know quiet energy intense energy you know and 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 i think that's you know that's a kind of important lesson to to be aware of i mean obviously you know it's not rocket science i mean everyone knows about dynamics but right you know i think as a, as a player to to be aware of, of like how the kind of energy that you put into your, your playing you know is in, is kind of a a good lesson oh yeah oh yeah most definitely most definitely and the, it it does show up and I'll, I'll just let the audience know that like um i had i'm not you know you know me fairly well um i'm not a, a very religious person or anything like especially when it comes to organized religion it's not my bag right i do consider myself somewhat of a spiritual person and the reason why i'm giving you this background is because of what i'm about to say um, in my life as a musician, you know, I had perhaps two moments so far where I had a religious experience, whatever that might mean for whoever, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and one was, and I told him this when, when I did an interview with him, um, with, with Pucci Bell, when he was playing with, with Marcus Miller at a jazz festival back in Austria, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second one was... Uh, Michelle and Dego Cello live at the Bowery Ballroom, and you were playing bass. Oh wow! Yeah, and and it was it was something else. Like it, I've I've been you know I I don't remember like how many concerts I've heard in my life like this, and I've been around musicians my literally my entire life, um, but I do remember uh, this this feeling um, of something else taking over, and this is you know me being in the audience and being sober <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and just just you know taking it all in and 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 this situation was taking over you know this this music was taking over that was coming that you guys um uh produced on stage you know it was just taking over and and, and it is uh it is incredible and it speaks to what you just what you just hinted at and that is you know energy in music that yeah. is you know, realizing that music is energy, that music is, you know, um, vibration or, or however you want to put that. Um, mm. and, yeah. and being able to channel that, you know, and that's, that's something that, that I find always remarkable about your playing. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, I can think about it. I, I've, I've had a few of those moments myself, you know, where- Okay. <laughs> um, I remember seeing the uh, Fort Apache band mm -hmm. at, um, it was a little club. It, it was called the Grand, no, on Grand Street. And there used to be like a jazz hanging there in the castle. And I remember seeing them play with Kenny Kirkland. Mm. They, something happened on that night. Man, and it was just like, you know, one of those transformative experiences. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, from the, from the you know the listening perspective, I, that's really those are important moments I think because they they stay with you you know and they remind you of what the power that music has you know and why we do this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, most definitely. Yeah, it is it is somewhat easy to get lost, especially when you 
now you know we're fast we're fast forwarding through your life basically you start learning music you start you know learning how to play the bass and all of that and you find yourself being a professional right um and of course you know we we all get caught up into playing gigs and playing jobs and you know doing a recording here recording there tour there you know whatever that may entail right um it is somewhat there is somewhat of a danger to to lose the connection right to to lose the connection to why are we doing this right those moments are so strong that there is just no two ways about it there's no no reason there's no way to to kind of lose that connection once you have those moments and once you open yourself up to them you know that's that's the other thing like it's are you are you able to sort of just be there as a as a listener and and sort of surrender you know to to Mm -hmm. what's going on on stage and what's what's happening there so i just wanted to share that with you because that was you know that was really uh, i'm trying to think of the year um and that i would think have been around 2005 i think that's quite possible because yep. that that was the bitter tour that, that I yes did for, and uh I, that was in 2005 yeah 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 most definitely i know that gene lake was playing playing drums mm-hmm. um I forgot. I, I'm pretty sure Federico uh, Gonzalez Gonzalez Pena was playing keyboards. Kato uh, was playing guitar. Um, yeah, it was, that was a <laughs> that was a really interesting experience. You know, just being in that band with Michelle. You know, because like she she's such a a force of nature. You know, yeah, in many ways, and um, you know, she she was a one of my teachers, you know, she, yeah. just hearing her play and playing with her and, and like kind of, you know. Um, Let's get into that a little bit deeper. Let's get into your influences on the bass because I think that also is an interesting um, is, is an interesting topic right there. Uh, mm-hmm. When you say like Michelle was one of your teachers, who were some other influences? Who were some other teachers, so to speak? Well, you know, talking about transformative musical experiences, another one was seeing Grand Central Station mm-hmm. at the age of 13 in in Seattle. Yeah. And just, you know, like <laughs> having my brain like blown out of my head, like what the, heck? you know, because I, I didn't know what these cats were doing. I, I was a little kid, you know, I'm like, <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, so I, I feel like Larry Graham is a huge influence on me. Yeah. Um, Marcus, you know, but I went to high school with Marcus. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and when we were in high school, you know, he was, he was starting to like blow up. And I remember, you know, I remember walking down the street one day, I tell a story and I, I hear, hey, Fimo, I turn around. And there's Marcus in a Porsche. <laughs> He's like, yo, you want to ride? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, I want to ride. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, because he, he was kind of like, you know, as, as a young high school dude, you know, who's kind of still, you know, I mean, we're all constantly learning, you know, but I, I he, he was someone that I was like, definitely influenced by because his level of success was just you know he was Mm. blowing up right and so so he was definitely one um of course gamerson you know all of the motown stuff um chuck rainey i loved Mm. Um, stanley and you know i mean jocko goes without saying I think you know uh, Alfonso Johnson. You know some of his stuff was 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 very influential. Right. And then you know the acoustic players like PC and Charlie Hayden and and uh, um, Ray Brown. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now here's one thing that I'm um and y- you know you have to excuse me if I'm asking a lot of questions, but that's well, what we're here for, right? Yeah. Um, one thing that I always find interesting is that now 
you know, you just listed all of these players, starting Larry Graham, you know, going all the way to PC, going all the way to Ray Brown, you know, um, and and yet your career or your musical output, right, is definitely um, like has a strong branding to it, meaning that there is, you know, uh, uh, jazz music in there, there's a strong avant-garde um, brand in there, there's a strong avant-garde uh, branch, so to speak, in there. Um, how was how did were you able to take all these influences and put that into the music that that you are playing that in, you know in the music that you're writing like how is how how do you get from there to here is is kind of where i'm trying to get to and i totally understand that this is this is a difficult question and, and kind of a large subject but you know if if you could share some of your of yeah of just how to get from there to to your sound you know i think it's i mean i've thought about this a lot you know and it it's an it's a very interesting question and i don't know if i, I have a, a definitive answer to it but mm. i would you know i think you know <laughs> basically it's just about trying to get in touch with who you are as a person you know Hello. even outside of music necessarily just like you know and and then i mean of course we're all influenced by the things that we hear and what and that we love and we and we're trying and we try to learn from the tradition and to be influenced by you know that but you know when it comes to kind of the way that we play or how we write ultimately i think it, it, you know there's no textbook for that so it right. becomes a, it, it becomes a question of just trusting your own instincts to some extent, you know, and in what you need to do to develop yourself as a player, what your strengths are, are what your weaknesses are, you know, what your uh, your fears are, and then right. confronting those things and just like you know, realizing you know like when when <laughs> you know when I subbed for you on Memphis, I mean when I first went in there, man. I was like having a heart attack, you know, because it's like, you know, that's not my my realm. But I but I confronted those fears, you know. I right, confronted right, it. Right, and, right. You know, I eventually got to the point where I was somewhat comfortable, you know, doing it. Right. But you know, it's sometimes you you have to kind of go out of your comfort zone and um, you know, not be afraid. And you might fall right. on your face, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, this, the important thing is that, that you know, you, through all these influences, through all these players, through all these teachers, you kind of zo you zero in, you focus in on who you are as a musician, right? And then that comes out in your output, right? That's, that's hopefully, you know, there's, there's a way for you to express that. You know, it's funny, though, because I don't, I think, I mean, if I'm, honest about it i don't because i i am who i am i don't mm. i don't know how if i could identify any specific you know like aspect of my playing that's totally unique to me because you know i just i'm just trying to do the gig i'm just trying to interpret it the best that i can right. so so it's not like i have a, a clear conception of like you know i'm going to play it in a certain way i'm I don't, I don't know if i'm expressing you no yeah yeah no you you make a lot of sense yeah no doubt no doubt i totally get it um there's um paul Nowinski is saying that he loves that that memphis was your first subbing show <laughs> 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 you and then i mean you didn't just decide you know sidestepping like all the esoteric as as um this i had a i had a, a conductor here on 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 one of these interviews called um sherry rosen right and and she calls what what i'm doing here with the live videos esoteric bass blah blah <laughs> <laughs> so, which is you know in reality like a great description <laughs> so sidestepping sidestepping the esoteric bass blah blah for a second you subbed for me on memphis right uh which was you know which definitely not only took you out of your comfort zone it, i had a, a bunch of people come in and check that out and were like ah not doing it you know 
Um, but then you also subbed for me on on Fun Home. <laughs> That's and, a funny story. Yeah, talk about talk about subbing subbing on Fun Home because that is something that was that was not easy. Well, I mean, you know, with, with the okay. So let let me preface it by saying, like, I really, I had no idea. I think you know, sort of the amount of preparation that it takes to to sub on a Broadway show. Right. So the first time I ever tried to sub was on a show Wicked. Mm. And I think I might have spent like, you know, a couple of days trying to learn the book. And I went in, you know, and I actually did a decent job, but I was not prepared. Mm. For it. And I didn't get it, right. you know, because of some silly, stupid, you know, page turning issues. I mean, I'm not even going to go into it. The right. conductor was a, you know, but anyway, um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, when I, you know, when I subbed on Memphis with, for you, I realized that I had to prepare more and I spent more time with it. I spent right. maybe a month, you know, really shedding the book and trying to get it down. And then on Fun Home, I, uh, that that was like a that was a nightmare, man. Because it was, if I remember correctly, five bases. That's correct. Yeah, including Arco, a stand up and Arco. Right. And there was a mixer, and you had to be like you know switching instruments, turning pages, and muting and unmuting specific instruments. You know, at 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 you know, and how do you prepare for that? I mean, I don't yeah, have yeah. A here, you know. So so anyway, I I came in. And I remember, you know, I was, I was once again, like almost having a heart attack, you know, and, uh, and I, I guess I did okay, you know, I yeah, mean, yeah. conductor yeah. like accepted me. So, but what happened then was in the interim, um, I got that Lazarus play. Right. Right. And so that Lazarus play with the rehearsals and everything, it ended up going, I don't know, four or five months of, of uh, and you had called me to sub, but I was busy right? because I was doing Lazarus. I couldn't do it, you know? So then one day after the Lazarus, I mean, it must have been close to a year after I had first come in. I remember I this. Call, yeah. I, I get a call on the phone and it's his story. He's like, oh man, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just gonna sit at home, man. He's like, yo, can you be, can you suffer me on fun home in like, you know, an hour? I'm like, sure, but I mean, I haven't looked at this book, you know, in like, in in a year, basically, you know. Yep. yep. And uh, <laughs> so, so, I, uh, you know, I said okay, and I live like on 28th Street and 8th Avenue, and the theater was like 50 something. 50 what was it 50 uh, 50 it was 50 50th street i believe okay. yeah so i i jumped i grabbed my base no i didn't grab my i, I was using your you know your base but i said i said to you look man i'm not gonna i can't do it on five bases right i'll do it uh, if i'm gonna do it i'll just do it on you know one or one or two bases or whatever and you were like oh cool, cool just show up you know right so i run down and i figure okay let me jump in a cab so i get in a cab it goes, it's like this two, like, block, you know, just bumper to bumper traffic. It's, and then, and then, like, the cab driver starts getting into an argument with this other guy. He gets out of the cab. He starts, like, you know, so I'm like, all right, get this. And I jump out of the cab. <laughs> and I ended up running, like, literally through rush hour, you know, from 30th Street up to, you know, up to the theater. And I think I got in like five minutes before <laughs> before the show, <laughs> and yeah. you know, I, I found you did it. Through. No, and you did it. You did it. You totally did it. And believe me, like everybody was just happy to, that you made it and that you were there, and 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 you know, yeah. you held your own. It was. It's, it's, just, it's just you know, we have these funny stories as musicians, things that happen to us. That yeah. that was one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, for what it's worth, you know, I've I've been in. I did, it might seem like this is like totally out of out of the ordinary, right? But mm -hmm. I've been there. Yeah. I've I, I've been there. Like I've been there with with Lion King, uh, forty five minutes, and I was still living uptown. Um, 
45 minutes before downbeat, you know, can you come in and play the show? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you start running, you start putting on your shoes while you're running down the street, you know. Um, I've been there with, with waitress, you know, uh, a couple times. And, and this was very, very similar to, to your fun home experience because I hadn't played, I had my own show yeah. and I hadn't played waitress in at least a year. And mind you, same thing, like you had to play a variety of basses. You had to, at one point, walk on stage with an upright bass that was where the end pin had a wheel on it, right? Mm. So you walk on playing the bass um, and you push it, you know, into a certain certain spot on the, on, on, on the stage, right? Um, all the while playing this particular song, like you had to have it memorized. Um, but you have to walk with a freaking upright bass. I mean, that's that that in and of itself is and played at the same time. Yeah. You know, that's like left foot, right foot, left foot, <laughs> right foot. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and then God help you if you end up in the wrong spot uh, on ah. stage because there is scenery flying in right from right. from above, right? So every now and then it happened to me. It didn't happen to me that particular time, but. I would walk up on stage playing the song uh, and be too far to the left or too far to the right. And then, you know, of course, we had, you know, genius uh, um, stage management who had a direct line to our in-ears, right? Mm -hmm. And they would tell you while you're playing, while you're like, you now you're kind of di uh, dividing your attention between, okay, I'm playing, I'm walking, I need to hit like this, this latch on the wheel to make the bass stop moving because otherwise it'll just <laughs> slip out from under me right. right while all of that is going on all of a sudden you hear the voice of god in your headphones uh george move to the left now <laughs> <laughs> yes. so i've been there you know this but is you know this is part said, of the gig yeah but having said that man i don't know anyone who is a more consummate, you know, bass player in terms of doing that kind of work than you. I mean, at one time you were doing, you were subbing on something like seven shows, was it? Oh, I was subbing at nine. Nine shows. I mean, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. That, that's unheard of. I don't know. I mean, that might no. be a record, actually. Um, here's the thing. It isn't. That's, it, it really isn't. Right? Let me just take you back to Memphis, right? Memphis, we had like a slew of keyboard two players come in, right? Yeah. And and all of them were, yeah, I, I'm I'm playing eleven shows right now. You know, I'm subbing. I'm so I don't have my own show. I'm playing twelve shows right now. I'm playing five shows right now. Yes, it seems like a lot, and it is a lot, right? It's yeah. I, I don't want to I don't want to take anything away from that. It is a hard gig, and I always say it's the hardest gig in town because I truly believe so. Um, but in the larger scheme of things, in the larger, you know, big picture thing, um, a lot of people do that. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what you do. You know, that's, that's what the subbing game is about. Uh, and, and yes, you do, at least I found that, that, you know, you only have so much space in your head. You only have so much room for focus, for memory, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you do notice, or at least I noticed that, uh, like everyday life stuff, mm -hmm. there was no more room for that. You know, right. like I thought you were gonna get the the groceries. I never remember. I honestly, we we had a conversation about that. <laughs> I had no idea, right? Yeah, right so, right. you know, that's that's that space is being taken up. You know, um, it's it's an interesting thing. Like, how do you? Because again, like your uh, career and your path, so to speak, you know, is like coming from this extremely um open um sort of free musical background uh where you rely on your ears a lot right and now but now you are a professional now you are you know you're making a living playing music um mm -hmm. and you kind of have to get the reading together you have to get all means of of communication together right mm -hmm. um is there something that that you find um where the two worlds so to speak meet you know where 
say you know these these gigs are sort of are very very um extreme meaning the theater gig right mm -hmm. and then the improvised music gig right do the worlds meet somewhere and it's also interesting because you had like you had now your own chair with lazarus and i definitely want you to talk about that as well well i mean in terms of you know I, I mean, I think, you know, it's just about interpretation, really. Mm -hmm. you know, um, right. I mean, when you see something on a, on a, on a page, you know, a, a baseline or, you know, changes, you know, there's a million ways that you can interpret that. Right. And so, you know, I think if what I try to do, you know, and I think what all musicians do to different, you know, and different degrees is just impart some of your own personality into into you know the written part and i even on you know i mean on memphis there were like little moments where i would try to kind of you know play a lick or something like that you know that wasn't necessarily written right. but i you know i had like a moment and i know that it was like something that you know maybe was a little sec second there where you would do you, like when i listened to the recording or whatever right so I'd say that, you know, that's where the intersection is for me. It's right. just like interpreting, you know, playing the part right, but then trying to in infuse some of my own personality or what I hear or ideas. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know? Right, right. Now, I think that the, the important the important word here is interpretation. That's that's mm -hmm. really like, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, anybody can read music. That's That's not difficult, right? Anybody can decipher black dots and black uh, lines on a piece of paper right? right that is not difficult but how t how do you interpret music right? right that's really where it's at and and interest and it's an interesting thing too this is actually when we talked about michelle this is something that really it really struck me was because i would you know when i was learning her, her music you know i would try to cop her lines and and I remember we were playing a gig and this was before the bitter, this was like, because I, I did, did stuff with her before that as well. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were playing um, and she, and I was like, you know, trying to cut one of her lines, and, you know, and I, it's, the sound wasn't there, you know, I, could, I couldn't emulate her sound. And then she picked up my bass and, you know, during the course of the con and gig and she played it. And it was like exactly that, you know, like her, it was her sound. Right. It was her hand, it was her physicality. It was her. It was her. her yeah. Period. Yes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think that inevitably, you know, we all have an inherent sound that, you know, comes out of us, you know, and uh, to, you know, to realize that, I guess is what I'm saying. You, your sound is different than mine. We could have the same instrument, same setup, same amp, everything. You're going to pick it up and have a little, you know, something's going to be your personality. And then I, when I pick it up, it's going to be my person. Right. That's just the right. way it is. Right, you know? right, right. I remember, <laughs> <laughs> I remember at Memphis, <laughs> I was playing my music man, right? And, and a lot of it is with a pick, right? Yeah. And, and granted, like, I have, I have perhaps a, a, a heavy touch. You know, yeah. you could you could call it that, and you don't. <laughs> so every every time I came in after you played the show, I had to turn the the um, the di. I had to turn it back down, <laughs> in order to make up for the touch. You had yeah. adjusted the di, and it totally worked in the house, and they were happy with it, and and all of that. Uh, but I, you know, if I didn't turn it back down. It was like it was blowing yeah. your brains out, you know. It's, it was it was really something. Like, well, I remember playing some of those parts, man. My hands would just get tired. I was like, because oh, I would yeah. try to try to dig in, you know, and, and, and emulate some of that, you know. Even and it, what, I'm sure it wasn't as, you know, wasn't exactly. But I remember, like, man, after a couple of those tunes, <laughs> I would just be like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this and I mean that was, you know, that was playing with a pick also and and trying to get. Uh, a sound that works in the um, works in the house really that was that was what was behind all of that like using the music man with the pickup placement in the back and yeah. playing with a pick made 
that sound work out right for whatever yeah. reason that particular theater um it kind of bypassed all of the trappings that you usually have to deal with like it's getting boomy and all of that it went right past all of that right yeah. so it was um that was a stroke of genius that alexis actually told me like she was like why don't you bring in the music man and i was like oh okay let's let's see how that works you know sure yeah. enough like minute you minute you bring that music man in play with a pick no questions anymore like no no nothing no yeah. can you turn down can you turn up no nothing it was just like pff, it set right in there it was pretty yeah. like that was that was remarkable it was remarkable how that how that just worked out you know what i mean that's yeah. that was pretty deep and it kind of brings me to 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 sound what i wanted to talk to you about because you have a fantastic sound and you have always had a fantastic sound yet you don't necessarily rely on the the usual fare meaning the jazz bass you know meaning um you know the two pickups instruments and all of that um i remember hearing you with um with the uh with the half and club bass you know when nobody was playing a half and club bass uh and then i remember hearing you a couple times now with dice and um last time was um at new blue with gene lakes band and you mm. played the gl uh gnl single pickup instrument right yeah. uh, i forgot what it's called but what is it about about single pickups um that kind of um that caught your attention you know i mean <laughs> i don't think it was anything uh like predetermined necessarily about single pickups um you know it, this, the question of sound is really sort of a uh, once again you know it's kind of a deep subject but mm. um what can i say it's because we're bass players you know at the, some, some somehow the nature of the instrument is such that we don't really know what our sound is like mm. out in the house right Right. Because of the fact that you know we're standing, I'm standing next to my amp, but the full kind of frequency of the instrument isn't really being expressed until it, you know, 20 feet out into the house, right? From, from the from the bass frequencies. So, I don't know if this is an answer necessarily, but I'm just trying to get a sound that I like, right? To my amp, right. Right, 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 right. Something that has some clarity to it. That's that you know, I don't want it to be bright and like you know, um, or too bright. You know, but I want it to be able to hear it. I, I want it to be deep. I want it to be fat. You know, so right. I, that's what I try to do. I just try right. to you know, as much as I can. And it doesn't. I don't know if it necessarily always works. You know, because every room is different, and you know, so some of it is just uh i say all this because i feel like some of it is is just kind of like i don't want to say guessing but like flying by radar because i don't necessarily know how my sound is being translated out in the house yeah. does that make any sense yeah yeah no this this makes this makes totally um this makes a lot a lot of a lot of sense uh now let me ask you this um let's take the two two um situations um Michel and Deke Ocello, right? You're playing a particular instrument, and Lazarus. I yeah. take it you're playing a different instrument. Instrument. What is it that that makes you choose one over the other? Or can you remember what you played with Michel? Sorry, there's a there's a, there's a alarm. Oh, Sorry. that's all right. No, my, say, my, say that again. My question was, can you remember what you played with Michel and Deke Ocello? Um, I'm pretty sure it was my, my like 77 jazz at the time. Oh, okay. 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 I did right. have a jazz for a long time. I was playing jazz. Oh, check that out. Okay. And then, um, and then in, 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 um, Lazarus, it was, it was weird. They, they kind of picked the instruments for me, which was strange. Mm. It was like Gibson, EB. I had, uh, two different Gibsons of five. You know, four, and if they were like the EB, not the EB, EBOs, yeah, like the EBO style, like this. Okay. With the double cutaways. 
Oh, check it out. And it, and it was, um, once again, you know, I was just trying to get the sound that I like. Right. Between, right. you know, the EQ and, uh, you know, the tone controls and the way, where I play the instrument on, you know. So, and, and it's, I, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I sort of feel like whatever instrument I play, I'm still sort of trying to get that same sound in a way, you know. Right, right. Yeah, what I also found interesting, and this is kind of taking me to to um, the screaming headless torsos, like in nineteen in the album nineteen ninety five, like you take a couple solos with distortion, yeah, right, and I cannot think of anybody else who made that work. Honestly, I mean, sure, there's Jaco, you know, there's there is perhaps Billy Sheehan, you know, but this is now this was in a completely different context, right? And when you listen to it, and I put the I put the album into the into the playlist of this video, um, when you listen to to you taking a solo with that distorted sound, it is like you've never heard it before. But at the same time, you wouldn't want to hear anything else because it fits the moment so well, right? So that's it. it I find that fascinating. Like how how do you come up with that? You know, that band was an interesting thing because, you know, Fuse was, Dave Fusinski, the leader of that band, you know, his whole kind of ethos was about trying to kind of push boundaries, mm -hmm. experiment, like kind of cross fertilizing, you know, house music with punk. You know, there was this kind of idea of, of like clashing different kinds of uh, musical styles together. So, he encouraged me to, you know, try something different, you know, and mm. it, I guess it, it happened to work. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's in, <laughs> a, in, in a major way. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it mm -hmm. definitely, you know, it, it, it kind of became the inspiration for for me um, being so adamant, like with, say, with, with Fun Home, right? I don't think that I did it with, my, with Memphis, but with Fun Home, I was really adamant about using um, two lines going to the house, and one line was totally uh, distorted and one line was completely clean, you know? Right. Um, and mixing those two signals together to get a good bass sound, right? Um, and I'm sure that, you know, that perturbed <laughs> a lot of <laughs> sound people <laughs> and, 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 the, and the creative team, but um, I was kind of adamant about it. Like, it's, it's, yes, we can we can have this, you know, seemingly extremes um, because the music is pretty strong and it's original music. So who's who's going to say that it has to be played a certain way? You know, if the composer doesn't tell me, OK, this I want this sound here, then I'm going to bring my my personality and my sound to it. Well, that speaks to, you know, how for, you know, the fact that they value you, you know, the fact that you can do that and say, hey, look, this is what I want, because, you know, some, in some situations, you might not be able to do that, but the yeah. fact that they respect you and, and you know, you're based on your experience and, and that, you know, that's great that, that you can do that. You know? Oh, yeah, there was, I mean, that, yeah, I totally, and I, I do acknowledge that, like this, yeah, there, there was, um, there was a lot of respect and a lot of, you know, they definitely trusted me with that res responsibility you know yeah. by the way ruben rodriguez says hello ha -ha. Ruben, that's a, that's a bad dude <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's been bad for as long as i you know back in the day man oh yeah oh yeah most definitely listen that actually brings me to to one um one thing that i wanted to ask you about and that was um the high school of music and arts because it seems oh, yeah. that that was like a, a nucleus of so much talent coming out of New York, right? And it certainly, it, it, it seems like, and not only like to understand the enormity of that situation, like coming out of New York and influencing musicians, music lovers all over the world, yeah. right? What was your take on that? What was what was it like back then? Was it just another high school for you kids, or was it was did you did you notice that oh shit, this is something is different here, you know? Oh wow! I mean, you know, once I once I got in and, and I was you know 
I, I started to realize that I was, you know, in, in essentially elite school, mm. you know, and that I was surrounded by people who, I mean, I didn't necessarily know, you know, what kind of impact they would, they would have, you know, on the whole music world. But I got the sense that, you know, these, these kids were extremely talented, you know, right. the, the ones that, um, you know, Omar was there, King right. Washington was there, uh, Marcus, uh, uh, Al McDowell, mm. Chris Rogers, Bob Franciscini, Tony Lewis, um, uh, Bernard Wright was there, Charlie Drayton was there, you know, a few after I left, I mean, like, you know, Adam was there, Ben Borowski was there, um, Bobby Broom was there. Mm. Um, I mean, it just, you know, but there was a lot of people and it had a history, which I'm, you know, I'm still kind of amazed when I hear about people that went to that school, you know, right. I didn't know it there, but, uh, you know, for, for me, I was just trying to, like, you know, I was just trying to keep up with these guys in, mm. in my own way, you know, and I, I, I just wanted to play and I, you know, and I was playing in different bands and like, you know, absorbing music as much as I could. Right. And, um, but that was really where I learned how to play. You know? Right, 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 right. I get that. No, I totally, I totally understand. And it's, it's just, it, it strikes me as so incredible that all this music came from, you know, that this particular school had, and I'm sure that it's not the only school, you know, states wide, state side and, yeah. and, 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 you know, worldwide, but, this school, this particular school had and still has an enormous influence on, on, you know, the culture, on, on music. Absolutely. But, you know, it was, and it, it was the school, but it was also New York, you know, yeah. New York yeah. was like a hotbed of culture and just, you know, yeah. I mean, I remember being in the East Village and just kind of like every other cat we met was a musician you know mm. coming coming from or going to a gig or a jam session it was like you know it was crazy you know there was mm. so much creative energy in new york at that time right 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 I mean, I'm, there still is I think. oh yeah oh yeah most definitely it's you know of course it's not the same that it, what it used to be but nothing is the same what right. it used to be to be honest you know <laughs> you yeah. do have to look for it somewhere else because <laughs> you know Things don't necessarily repeat uh, as such, which kind of brings me to to, to may, maybe the last thing because we've been on already for quite some time. Um, but I did wanted to ask you about your album, right? I remember, um, I know we were hanging out one day, and 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 you were nice enough to give me a ride somewhere, and you were like, uh, and by the way, here's like, this is my new album. This is this is my album, my solo album. Just you know, finished mixing this song. Listen to this, right? So I listened to a song of um, uh, music from the tree. Uh, song, um, songs from the tree. Songs from the tree. Uh, in your car um, before it was released, which I really, you know, incredibly appreciated. Um, but talk about your album. Talk about your music, because um, it doesn't sound like anything else. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, I've always tried to write music right. and that's kind of how I started playing the, you know the bass I would like I said I would just sort of write these bass lines or write these melodies I didn't really know what I was doing but I would kind of create these ideas for songs you know so I, I was constant I would always constantly be coming up with ideas and and so you know in some of the bands that I was in I, I wrote music like for Screaming Hellas Torsos, I wrote some stuff for them. I wrote stuff for Lost Tribe and, you know, other groups as well. And um, so it's something that I've always wanted to do is just like kind of express myself through writing. Right, right. And, and that was kind of has been the impetus for me doing records. I mean, I've done three of my own records. So far. Right, right. And, um, but... I've kind of been on a writing slump recently and I, I need to kind of get back into it because I, it, I feel like it's a part of my expression. And, and, and also as a bass player, I think to, when you write, it, it in, informs your playing. 
you know? right right most definitely yeah it's like the the whole reading and transcribing transcribing really is the reverse to reading mm. you see what i mean like, at yeah. least that's how i see it you know is yeah if you, if you do a bunch of transcriptions like you you reading will pop up and will get better real fast right because yeah. you have to think about all of these things i would imagine i'm not much of a writer myself a composer myself but um i would imagine that yes when you compose it is somewhat the reverse to perhaps improvising perhaps you know improvising is maybe composition in the moment or something like that i don't know is that is that some where you're coming from with that yeah I, I, you know it's funny i mean i just i don't know what my necessarily what my impetus for writing is it's just something i get excited and when i if i hear something that i wrote and it sounds good i'm like oh that's cool I mm. like it, you know, right, right. something that just makes me feel excited about it. And, and you know, but having said that, sometimes the rock, the writing process can be a little torturous, you know, because mm. you're, you're constantly like, you know, oh, that sucks or, uh, you know, and, and then you just try to figure out ways, psychological ways of dealing with that, you know, where you don't dwell on things too much and you just keep moving. And then you, you know, come back and listen to things later with fresh mm. ears. I mean, there's different things that, you know, that I try to do. But, you know, I mean, I, when I think about, you know, the master writers of our, you know, of music, it's like, it gets a little intimidating because I'm like, damn, you know, how the hell, I'd like to be able to do that. And I don't right. feel like I really have the skills to do it, but... I realized that the only way to kind of move in that direction is just to keep doing it, you know, right. and right. hopefully one day, maybe I'll have a chance to, to write for an orchestra or, or whatever, you know? Right, 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 right. Uh, we have a question that uh, Vincent Sanson wants to know whether you write on, on keyboard. I write on keyboard. I write on bass. I write on guitar. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So but, just utilize whatever whatever there is you know yeah and yeah, sometimes yeah. i'll try to just you know i'll start with a drum groove or i'll start with like you know uh just a melody or you know mm. yeah, yeah 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 most definitely no, that's that makes a lot of sense um i'm i'm currently in the process of writing this music for another podcast that i'm kind of putting together oh, so cool. this you know for the first time i'm i'm thinking about okay well does this make sense, you know, and, and, and have to ask myself questions like, is anybody going to understand this? And I'm like, well, it really doesn't matter. It, as long as I understand it, perhaps somebody else will understand it, but I need to understand it first. Right. You see when what you I mean? you say understand it, what, what, meaning I, that it, it, it needs to speak to me one way or the other, aesthetically, um, groove wise, you know, it needs to speak to me. You know, whatever that might right. entail, really, you know. Um, but uh, if if it doesn't speak to me, meaning if it if I don't like it, then it's going to be a hard sell, you know, convincing somebody else that this is supposed to represent a certain feeling, mood, whatever, right? So how do you get to the point where, like, because what I find is sometimes it's, it's hard to be objective about, you know, your own work as a player or as a writer or whatever, because you have, you have such, you know, an emotional, um, your emotional world is sort of tied up in it. Right. And, and I've had, I've had uh, experiences where, you know, I'll think, I'll listen to something that I did or, or listen to something I wrote. And while I'm in the moment, you know, and, and, I'll hate it or something will bother me really, you know, a lot. And then I'll leave it alone. And two months later or whatever, I'll come back to it and I'll listen to it. And I'll be like, why did I, why did I hate that so much? That doesn't actually sound that bad. Exactly. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that, that happens all the time. Happens all the time. Yeah. So that tells me that there's like some kind of an emotional aspect to the, the judgment of it, you know, right. that, is hard to um, and 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 maybe you know in the writing process you know it's important to just not judge things so much and just kind of let it flow 
mm. and then you know come back to it later or something right right no that that makes a lot of sense there's no doubt mm -hmm. about that i think that that very often we have um you know this uh our our personalities are kind of split right because mm -hmm. the, there's there's the the player there is the listener there's the music fan there's the the you know the the person who the the, the professional who wants to make money off this you know so all of these various entities kind of tug at us and target our sensibilities and our sense of aesthetic perhaps you know yeah. and of course they target our self-worth for what it's worth yeah. you know and 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 it it's awfully difficult sometimes to sort of tell one part of your personality to just okay you take a seat right you be in the background now this other part needs to take over right this mm -hmm. other part needs to express themselves right now. Um, and we'll get to you who's sitting down right now. We'll get to you in a second, right? But right now it's this person's time, right? So, yeah, they, yeah. You that's know, a great way of thinking about it, man. You know, this, uh, that, that I, find, I find kind of difficult. And, and, and perhaps that's where a lot of the self-doubt comes in. And, and you know, the, um, I was listening to this podcast um, Otil Burbridge has a great podcast and he had Victor Wooten on, right? And they kind of identify that part of your personality as the critic, right? And we all have a critic inside of us, mm. right? So, and for what it's worth, you know, perhaps we all should have a critic. So we can sort right. of, you know, gauge whether, whether the direction that we're going in is, is correct or is, you know, authentic to who we are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but sometimes you just you do have to tell the, the critic like take a break like take a mm -hmm. hike you know um you got to sit this one out because this other part of you of my personality needs to express itself right now you know mm -hmm. um so well, i think that's that's the, the operative word express right yeah so it's like if you're expressing something you know like just in terms of what's going on in your life at the moment or you know I mean, it's interesting because, like, I would have thought during this time, this pandemic time, you know, that I would be more be able to tap into kind of like the, you know, the emotional stuff that's been going on. But maybe that's going to happen later. You right. know, maybe right. now's not the time. And I just have to be like, okay, when it's when I'm ready to do that, or when it, you know, when I'm ready to express myself, whatever that is, it'll happen. But right. I do think you have to kind of sit down and just kind of create the space for that. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 most definitely, most definitely, and you do have to be disciplined to create this this space yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that is very, very important. Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, cool. Listen, um, I don't want to keep you any longer. I really, I, I so appreciate you taking the time today. And, Thank you, and George, it was a, it was a pleasure. You know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't do these kind of things very often, so it's. Uh, it's, it's nice to be asked to, to oh yeah most definitely man i wouldn't i wouldn't miss it that's that's awesome i'm, I'm just you know i'm so thrilled that you're here today um uh, i know that the audience is thrilled about it as well um you know it's uh i did put up um links to your album i put up links to to dice's album um what else did i put up i put up links to lost tribe uh, and I also put up a link to your mymasterclass.com. Oh, cool. That whole thing. So, you know, for all those watching and listening out there, there's a lot of information in the description of this video. Um, check it out. Uh, by all means, you know, open yourself up to this music and, and the artistry of, of Fima Efron because it does influence you in, in, in a lot of ways. And I hope that my example is a good example where you know the sound that you had on 1995 influenced me doing broadway wow because okay? yeah. i mean this is you know two rather large extremes so yeah. uh it, Thanks, it all George. i really appreciate it man oh yeah, yeah yeah most definitely it all shows up all right <laughs> <laughs> well listen fema take it easy stay safe stay sane out there much love to the family Thank you. um and uh you know hopefully we'll see each other uh in the not too rather than later man Let's yeah hope. not too distant future i mean i haven't i haven't i don't think i've been in manhattan like in the last year maybe twice wow is that crazy well 
Did you get your Did you get your vaccine yet? Not yet, but I just got yesterday. I got my 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 first date. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about yourself? I got my first one, and I have my second one April 11th. So. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well, <laughs> listen, fingers crossed that we'll we'll make it through this because um, right, George, all the it's best. It's about time. Man. Same to same here, same here. Take right. care, brother. Later. Later. Bye. All right, and for all you watching and listening out there, um, that was the great Fima Efron. Um, thank you all for being here with us. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time. I want to once again say thank you to Fima for making the time and making himself available. Um, I'm a big fan of his playing. Um, I highly recommend checking him out, uh, checking out the music that is in the description for this video. And... Um, yeah, I really don't have much more to say. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to say what I say every week. Uh, be cool, be kind, and remember we only have each other. And um, I'll see you all next week. All right, later.